Did it work? Yeah. All right. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Let's um, bow in a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Our God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity of looking at your word this evening and studying it together. And as we do so, we pray as always that uh, the things said in non will honor and glorify the name of Christ and edify the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Um, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1 in your Bibles. Tonight we're going to uh, conclude... I never thought I'd heard that word. Um, our, our look at the five points of Calvinism, TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. We will spend one more week next week, which to me is the really, uh, the really insidious thing about Calvinism, is not these five points that we've looked at, because to me the five points are relatively easy to look at and say, well, that's just nuts. Um, ridiculous, that's the word. That's just ridiculous. But, but the, 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 the insidiousness of it is the way it creeps in to all of our thinking and all of our understanding, um, you know, uh, that, that people say, well, it's, it's, um, was, oh, uh, when Caleb, uh, wasn't going to be operated on, Rhonda sent out a text, a group text to some people, and somebody, was, I just knew the number, don't know who it was, somebody responded and said, well, God knows what's best, you know, that, that Caleb, he wasn't going to be operated on, so God knows what's best, so it's all, you know, he's got this all figured out, and so that kind, that part of Calvinism, even for people that will look at the five points and say, <laughs> you know, like Herb said, it's ridiculous, that part of Calvinism is so ingrained in everybody, well, in most believers' way of thinking that it's it's very hard to get it out. And um, they would never acknowledge they're a Calvinist, but they'll certainly live their lives like a Calvinist, even though they don't hold their you know, pin their salvation on the doctrines of Calvin. They certainly live their lives in that way. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit next week to wrap things up. Then the following week, we're going to eat. So. Yeah. And, and like, as Donna pointed out, there'll be a big crowd that night, much bigger than tonight. So, all right, Ephesians chapter 1 and, um, oh, verse number 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So we've been looking at, as I said, the five points of Calvinism, and you know, I'll write them up here on the board one more time. Um, total depravity, um, uh, un, un, unconditional election. Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> P. I T U L L. Wow, I can't even spell tulip tonight. I'm. I'm. It's a good thing it's not marigold or chrysanthemum. I'd be in real trouble. Um, L is uh, limited atonement, and uh, I is irresistible grace. Right, Herb? Irresistible grace, and uh, P is perseverance of the saints. And perseverance of the saints is what we're looking at tonight, and we'll, we started looking at it last week, and uh, and we will. There's there's a better pen. We will wrap up with perseverance of the saints tonight. So I'll just read a few of the definitions that we read last week. Yeah, we usually have been spending the first week looking in detail at the definitions of it and what Calvinist writers have to say about it. Then the second week, we kind of look at, at the verses that. That demonstrate you know what it really is, what what the doctrine really is that we should be believing. So we'll we'll do that tonight. Just review a couple of the verses, or the not verses rather, view a couple of the quotes that we looked at last week of of Calvinistic writers and what they say perseverance of the saints is. Um, so Palmer defines it as the term perseverance of the saints emphasizes that Christians, saints, as Paul calls them in his letters, will persevere in trusting in Christ as their Savior. They will not turn on and then turn off, but they will continue believing forever. So the saints will persevere in their believing, and of course that 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 gets carried on on to then, if you're persevering in, in your believing, you're also then living a, a holy life. Um, Cockrell says this, they whom God has regenerated by the Holy Spirit and effectually called to a state of grace will persevere in progressive sanctification until they are brought finally to glory. So 
So it's, it's more than just you're going to keep believing, but you're going to be progressively sanctified. You're going to continue to get more and more sanctified. We te- he goes on to say, we teach that all true saints will continue in a state of holiness and righteousness through this life on earth until they are brought to heaven at last. So perseverance of the saints is, is just that. That all true saints, if you're truly saved, truly a believer, if you're truly one of the elect, and the only way you really know that you're elect, as we saw last week, is if you persevere till the end. If you don't persevere till the end of your life, that is if you don't continue in a state of holiness and righteousness through this life on earth till you're brought to heaven, as this man says, then that proves that you never were one of the elect. You never were one of the elect, so you never were saved, so you did not persevere till the end. Um, so then the, the other side of that is, well, what if you don't persevere? And Calvin said this, those who do not persevere unto the end belong not to the calling of God, which is always effectual. So if you're, if you're truly the elect, you will persevere. Flip side of that, if you don't persevere, you are not truly, uh, you don't truly belong to God. MacArthur, John MacArthur says, No one who denies God should be deceived into thinking that because he once professed faith in Christ, he is eternally secure. So one mistake that people make is they kind of equate perseverance of the saints to what we would teach as a doctrine of eternal security. And it really, as we saw last week from the quote, or quotes in our week before last, has nothing to do with eternal security. In fact, it's just the opposite of that. You have no idea whether or not you're secure because you have no idea if you were the elect unless you persevere till the end. Um, Arthur Pink says, Reader, if there is, is a reserve in your obedience, you are on the way to hell. And that one is a really strong, if there is a reserve in your obedience. So in other words, if there's any reservation about obeying. If you're not, if you don't get up every day and just thinking, man, I am so excited today about obeying the Lord, then according to Pink, you are on the way to hell. So it's a, it's a, it's a really strong doctrine and it's a really strong, um, it, it really puts the emphasis on what have you, what have you, uh, what are you doing? How are you living? Um, Gunn says, these are those, there, I'm sorry, there are those who profess faith in Christ and join the church who later abandon the faith and return to worldly living. A person who does that is giving evidence that he is not a Christian and never has been a Christian. So someone that, quote, departs from the faith, from their perspective, you know, if you profess faith in Christ, join the church, abandon the faith, return to worldly living, you never were a Christian. So that's, that's their answer. You never were. F- Otis says falling away from the faith doesn't mean that one loses his salvation. It means that one never had any salvation from the beginning. So, And that's where this doctrine gets, gets conflated with and confused with eternal security. Because a Calvinist if you truly are the elect, then you are eternally secure. But their their reasoning is, just what Otis says, falling away from the faith doesn't mean that you lose your salvation. So if you, you know, profess faith in Christ, join the church, as one of them says, live a godly life, and then later fall away, it's, it doesn't mean that one loses your salvation, Otis says. It means that one never had any salvation from the beginning. So they would agree with us that those that are saved, they would say those that are the elect, are eternally secure. But they determine whether or not you are one of the elect by your actions. And if your actions go astray later on, then it's a demonstration that you were not eternally secure. So... That's the the bottom line. Um, Pink also says, conclude we then, you know, these guys always said things backwards. Why didn't you say, we conclude then, instead of conclude we then, that holiness in this life is absolutely necessary to salvation, not only as a, a means to the end, 
but by a nobler kind of necessity as part of the end itself. So holiness of life is absolutely necessary to salvation. If you don't live a certain way, if you don't, don't demonstrate your salvation by your holiness of life, you're done. So, uh, 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 one more quote from Pink, because it, you know, when you take perseverance of the saints and try to make it eternal security, or once saved, always saved, somebody, some people like to call it, um, although I think that, I think once saved, always saved is kind of a pejorative way to look at it. You know, we call it eternal security because the Bible says we are secure in Christ. Once saved, always saved, it, when I've heard the term used, usually as someone that's, that's speaking in a negative, oh, you believe once you're saved, you're always saved. Well, yeah, I do, but I, you know, it's security is, is, is what, what we're talking about. So Pink says this, quote, There is a deadly and damnable heresy being widely propagated today to the effect that if a sinner truly accepts Christ as his personal Savior, no matter how he lives afterwards, he cannot perish. That is a satanic lie. Something more than believing in Christ is necessary to ensure the soul's reaching heaven. And that's really the bottom line of this. Something more than believing in Christ is necessary to ensure the soul's reaching heaven. So that's a pretty bold statement. You know, when, when we focus so much on the simplicity of the gospel, that it's all it's faith plus nothing and, and all those kind of things. Um, this doctrine clearly strikes right at the heart of that. And I just want to read that again to, to let it sink in. There is a deadly and damnable heresy being widely propagated today to the effect that if a sinner truly accepts Christ as his personal Savior, no matter how he lives afterwards, so he truly accepts Christ as his Savior, no matter how he lives afterwards, he cannot perish. That is a satanic lie. And then this is the, the conclusion. Something more than believing in Christ is necessary to ensure the soul's reaching heaven. So that seems to put it, you know, all because there's this line between perseverance and, and I am persevering, but God is preserving. And, and, and who's responsible for this? In this quote, it seems to put the responsibility on the person. Something more than believing in Christ is necessary. So you must do something more. You must perform uh, in, uh, uh, in order to ensure the soul's reaching heaven. Now, but this is typical with Calvinism. It gets kind of confusing which comes first, the chicken or the egg, because they will say you, you have to persevere. Um, but then they'll say God is preserving you and every action that you've taken was determined before the world began. So if you don't persevere, whose fault would that be? Yeah, yeah, because who determined those actions? God determined those actions. So it's, you know, and, and, but that means he also, if you, if you never were saved... Which is what they would say. You you do you you profess faith in Christ, start living a, a godly life, and then turn away. Well, who ordained that you would do those godly things? Well, God did that too. But then He ordained that you would start doing ungodly things. So it really gets a whole mishmash of just you say, well, what the heck are you talking about? So um, so, but that's that's you know just a quick review of what. Perseverance of the Saints is, and it's maybe one of the ones that's the most, as we saw, two, it's, it's been two weeks ago, actually, yeah. as we saw two weeks ago, we, did, we read a lot of quotes, we're not going to do that again tonight, how the same verse, a Calvinist will look at it, an Arminian will look at it, and they will, they will, they will interpret it the same, both of them will say, see, this says you have to live a godly life. Or you're not saved. Um, for example, one of those we're going to look at them tonight. First Corinthians chapter nine, and see what what they really are about. First Corinthians chapter nine, uh, and verse number twenty six. Well, start start. Well, it just read verse twenty six, but then we'll get the context. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. 
but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway or be rejected or, or be disapproved. So Paul Paul's says, I keep my body in subjection, lest after I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Um, and, and of course, both, both Arminians and Calvinists say, you see there, if you, don't, if you don't do certain things and live a certain way, then you will be cast away. That's, that's just the way it is. You'll be cast away. Um, and of course, they take cast away. All these verses... And as we saw with some of the other Calvinistic things, they're not looking at the verse in context. They, they pull a verse out like that and say, there you go. But if, if you look at what Paul is talking about here, he's talking about his ministry, his service. Verse 24, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So, so what's, what's at issue here? Is, is it about Saul, Paul's salvation or is it about obtaining a crown? Running the race well to obtain a crown? Well clearly it's about obtaining that crown. I therefore run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So the, the, the topic there is, we do it to obtain an incorruptible crown. Well, if you look at the context of 1 Corinthians, you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and, and what has Paul talked about? Verse 6, I have planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. He, P Apollos and Paul are both saved. One plants, the other waters, but there's going to be a reward according to that labor that they've done after salvation. Verse 9, we are, we are labors together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, the day shall declare it, it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So in this same book, in this same context that Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and the church at Corinth, what is their problem? Their problem is, verse um, 3 of chapter 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? But the whole, the very fact that he says to, to the church, Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So, so what are these people? They are sanctified. They are saints. And then he writes to those people and says, ye are carnal, there is envying, there is strife, there are divisions, you're carnal, and you walk as men. Now what would a Calvinist say about those people? They were, uh, they were never really saved. Because you can't be carnal and walk as men and have divisions and strife. And verse 4 uh, of chapter 3, for while one saith, I am a Paul, another Apollos, are ye not carnal? So the whole the whole thrust of 1 Corinthians argues against the idea that you can determine a person's salvation or their election by are they, are they persevering? Are they acting properly? Because clearly he writes to people that are sanctified and saints and then 
you know, gets right into it and says, you know what, you're carnal and you walk as men and there's strife and there's divisions and there's envying and, and of course the list goes on and on. But then immediately after that he says, look, there is going to be a judgment of this. There is going to be a reward offered if, your, if what you build upon the foundation I laid is gold, silver, precious stones, you'll receive a reward. If it's wood, hay, or stubble, you will not receive the reward. Um, so, so clearly, the whole, what Paul is saying argues against the Calvinist idea. And, and he goes on, obviously chapter 5, it's reported commonly there is fornication among you, such as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, the one should have his father's wife. Yet, these people are saints. Verse chapter 6, dare any of you having a matter against another to go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Um, chapter 7 verse 1, concerning things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He talks all about marriage and the problems that are going on with marriage there. Uh, in chapter 8 he deals with worshiping or eating things offered to idols. There's all sorts of problems. But in no place does he ever indicate because of this you have demonstrated that you're not persevering and you're no longer saints. He does say your service may not be approved and you will not receive a reward and I don't want to be in that boat. I don't want to be a person that after I preach to others I myself would be cast away. I myself would not receive that reward. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 um, there's, there's a good um, indication of uh, of the distinction here between the position. Calvinists look at sanctification, and there is this aspect of it, but Calvinists look at sanctification as something that is, is ongoing. Um, I wanted to read the one, uh, one quote that has that. Yeah. They, the quote is from Cockerell. They whom God has regenerated by the Holy Spirit and effectually called to a state of grace will persevere in progressive sanctification until they are brought finally to glory. They will persevere and they will progressively be sanctified. So here's, here's the, the, the problem with, with that understanding of it. He writes to people in Corinth and he says, Unto them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now are those people, have they become progressively sanctified? Where are they sanctified? In Christ, what? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, exactly. I don't know, is that what you said, Don? Oh, well then, good. I'll, I didn't, I didn't, I, I heard Bob, I didn't hear you for sure. Uh, so they're sanctified, just like when we went back to and looked at election. Where, is, where are you elect? Where is your election? In Christ. Your sanctification is in Christ. It's not a progressive thing. Now, we do seek to live a more godly life as we go along, but our sanctification comes because we're in Christ. And these people that are sanctified in Christ have envy, strife, division, um, fornication. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, um, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. So, you were, the, you were adulterers, idolaters, uh, effeminate, fornicators, you were all these things, but now you are sanctified. You are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. And all of those things, the washing, the justification, the sanctification, are in that passage presented as positional truths. You are justified, declared righteous, why? Because you're what? Who? In who? In Christ. Why are you sanctified? Same reason, because you're in Christ. So he writes to people that are committing fornication and says, you are not fornicators anymore. 
Such were some of you. Ye are not idol. He writes to people that are, are having this big fuss about eating things offered to idols. And he says, you're not idolaters anymore. And, and he writes to people that um, have, have a problem, you know, all the marriage issues in chapter 7. You're not adulterers or fornicators anymore. Um, you are not thieves anymore. You are not covetous anymore. You are not drunkards. Over in chapter 11 when he talks about the Lord's table, what's the problem at the Lord's table at Corinth? They're getting drunk. And he, but he says, you're not drunkards anymore. So the whole, the whole point of this is, you are not these things anymore. And, and, and the whole point of the book is, you know, you're doing all these things, but that's not who you are. And it's not, it, not doing those things is not what makes you who you are. Your faith in Christ is what makes you who you are. And you ought not be doing those things because of who you are. Because these people, thieves, or covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Those kinds of people... People that are those things in their heart, in their soul, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but... There's one of those buts again. You're not that anymore. And, he, and he st even though they're doing some of those things, they are not those things anymore. And he goes on to say, all things are lawful unto me. I can do any of those things, and it's lawful for me. But all things are not expedient it's not the best thing. It's not the way for me to be approved and have my service approved. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I, 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 can, I can do any of those things, but I'm not going to let those things control me. Meats for the belly, the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And, and, and why is, is the body for the Lord? Down in verse um, 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man uh, doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. Ye are uh, not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You are bought with a price price. And, and the evaluation of, of us at the judgment seat of Christ comes um, based on what, we, what service we've, we've performed. And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He's not talking about, I'm going to lose my salvation. Certainly he would have been warning all those people in Corinth, you're losing your salvation. You've lost. You, <laughs> you're done. And never does he indicate that to them. He indicates to them, you need to live like who you are. Live like what you are. And, and that's the, the point that Paul's making there. So, um, so to take chapter 9, verse 27 out and say, yes sir, see this is proof, just ignores the context of everything Paul's saying in the book. Which, as we've seen by this point, is common practice for the Calvinists to just ignore what's around it. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 6, is another one that we looked at two weeks ago that, that, that both a Calvinist and an Arminian will look at and say, see there, that's, that's it, that's, that's the, the, uh, the, the, the ticket. Um, chapter uh, 4 verse 16 of 1 Timothy, Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So the question there is, what's save. I mean, save means a lot of different things in a, in a lot of different places in Paul's epistles and, and he's, he's not talking here. He's talking again about our service. Um, verse 13, uh, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy, by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. So the profit you gain from that study as you teach will appear to all. Remember, Timothy, he's, he's telling Timothy here that you need to, to teach and, and, and to preach. Um, verse, um, well, we won't go into 2 Timothy. When you're into 2 Timothy, he talks about chapter 2, verse 1, 
Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, shall be able to teach others also. Thou endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So he is telling Timothy, you need to meditate on these things I've written. Give yourself wholly to them. Take heed to yourself, to the doctrine, continue in them. In doing this, thou shalt save thyself. So, so listen. If that salvation is eternal salvation, then who's responsible for your salvation? You are. You You shall save yourself. Now, no Calvinist believes that, but yet when you use that verse, even an Arminian doesn't believe that, that you save yourself. I mean, they believe you participate in it somehow, but you, you know, that salvation is about saving yourself uh, from, from despair, from misunderstanding, from being tossed about to and fro by all winds of doctrine as you give yourself to these things and meditate on them. So again, you're, you pull a verse out of context and you've got a pretext for something that's, that's not good. Um, back in the book of Matthew, th- this one is, from our perspective, extraordinarily easy to understand and to, to realize the context. Matthew chapter 24 Verse number 13, but it's one that both Calvinists and Arminian use to say, see, you gotta, you got to persevere. Uh, Matthew 24, 13, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So, you got to endure to the end. And of course, you take that, you rip that out of the context, and, and it's, what do they say it is? The end of what? The, what they're saying, yeah, right. Well, we we understand it to be the end, the end times, end of the world. But as Herb said, what they're saying is you got to endure to the end of your life. That's not the context where you find it in in verse. Um, uh, uh, I don't want to read the whole thing, but verse 6, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end is not yet. The end of what? The end of your life? No, that's not about the end of your life. It's about the end of the world, the end of the age, the end times before the Lord returns. You know, then he said, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And he goes on and lists other things. Verse 8, these are the beginning of sorrows. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then shall, what? The end, the end come. The end of your life? No, the end of the age, the end of the world, the return of Christ. Um, if you go back to Matthew 10, he uses that same terminology in Matthew 10, and they make the same mistake there. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 22. Uh, same kind of context, Matthew 10, 22. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he, shall, that, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee into another, for verily I send to you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel to the Son of Man become. So so what's it what's the end when the Son of Man what? When he comes. The other thing is, so that's the end. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Does that mean if you are martyred for your faith during the tribulation that you're lost? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. If you if you're going to take that tack that that it's it's that that save there is eternal salvation, then if you if you're martyred during the tribulation period because you didn't endure to the end, you got killed before the end got here. Um, but if you the same if you endure to the end, the same shall be saved. At the end of the seventieth week, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, what? comes the end but who comes Christ comes what does Christ do when he comes war War. he pours out wrath if you are the remnant that has endured all the way through Daniel's 70th week 
Are you going to taste his wrath when he returns? No. In fact, that's what Matthew 24, if you just flip back there, that's what Matthew 24 is about. Um, verse um, 26. Therefore, uh, well, no, let's go down. Uh, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So if you, if you endure through Daniel's 70th week and all the tribulation of that week and you get to the end, what's he going to save you from? The wrath. The wrath. The ra Just like we, as members of the body of Christ, are saved from the wrath to come. Israel also is saved from the wrath to come. He that endures to the end the same shall be saved. You make it through, and, and, and just flip back quickly to Isaiah. Israel is told this in, in, in the prophetic scriptures, in Isaiah chapter 26, um, in verse, um, verse 16, Lord, in trouble they have visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. This is Isaiah 26, 16. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's Daniel's 70th week. Um, and you get down to verse um, 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. So hide yourself until the indignation is past, that time of, uh, of Jacob's trouble, that, that tribulation time. Come, my people, oh, I'm sorry, verse 21, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The Lord also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So the Lord is going to come and punish the inhabitants of the earth, but these believers that hid themselves in that time of Jacob's trouble, what happens to them? They're saved. They're gathered by, the, he gathers the elect out of the four corners of the earth. Um, Isaiah 13 says the same thing. Just flip back a couple pages, um, and, and you know, we're not going to read the whole thing, but in verse uh, 11, this is the day of the Lord. I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, <clears throat> and I will cause the arrogance of their proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. But, but chapter 14, verse 1, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them, and bring them in their places, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land the Lord, uh, of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in, in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. They are saved from the wrath and delivered into the kingdom. So those passages in Matthew about enduring, that he that endures to the end the same shall be saved, absolutely nothing to do with soul salvation, nothing to do with eternal salvation, nothing to do with the end of your life. The context is very clear about that. So I want to take just a couple of minutes. Oh, I guess just a couple. So, so what does the scripture teach? What is especially Paul? Matthew chapter, or, yeah, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. What does Paul teach about our security, eternal security? Matthew, wow. <laughs> Romans 5 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. 
We have the atonement. We are at one with him. Down in, in chapter 8 of Romans, in verse number 31, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as a sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul, Paul says uh, nothing, height, uh, depth, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come. This is the same Paul that says in chapter 7, Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. Now wait a minute. How can Paul say, the things I hate, that I do? In, in verse 23, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The bot, this physical body. And Paul makes that distinction clearly throughout. Our salvation is about what happens to us spiritually. We are made alive in Christ. We are united with Him. We are seated with Him in heavenly places. We are blessed with Him with all spiritual blessings. We are sanctified. We are justified. We are washed. We are, are all of those things in Christ. Yet, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the, the, the illustration of that is right here in Romans 8. Get Romans 8 and get Ephesians chapter 1. And we look at this, we've looked at this in the past, but it's, it's a really good way to demonstrate that you've got to draw this distinction between who we are spiritually and where we reside in a body of flesh. In, in, if, in Romans chapter, well, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Do we right now have redemption. Yeah. Yes. But in, in chapter 8 of Romans, verse 23, and not only that, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, our spirit is redeemed, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption, what? Of our body. Of our body. So is our body redeemed? No. no. It's not. And that's the, that's the, so, so a Calvinist is saying, I'm going to look at the actions of your body and determine what's true of your spirit. And nowhere in Paul's epistles does he tell us we can do that. Now, should, should what your flesh produces match who you are in the spirit? Absolutely. If you look in Ephesians chapter 2, since we're over there in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. That salvation, that is his work in us. Created in Christ Jesus. A new creature in Christ Jesus. He's, he, he's already told us that. Um, we, we are a new creature. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. New creature in Christ. Unto good works which God hath before ordained that ye should walk in them. So should you walk in good works? Does it, does it, uh, does it prove your salvation? No. Are there people that walk in good works that aren't saved? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are people that look like they're persevering, but... You know, what does Christ say in Matthew chapter 7? Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. That, you know, some will come and say, Lord, and, well, go to Matthew chapter 7. Go to Matthew chapter 7. <coughs> 
22, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful things. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. But how can it be iniquity? It's casting out demons. It's casting out, uh, or devils rather. It's, it's prophesying in his name. It's doing wonderful works. Uh, and that, because spiritually, you're dead. You're like Judas. Spiritually, he was dead. And to me, the verse, if you go back to Paul's epistles, I mean, there's lots we could look. I, mean, I think we in this assembly have sufficiently studied eternal security and, and our position in Christ that, that you understand that's where our security comes from, not from what you do. But there is this passage in 2 Timothy which you know, gives some people fits, and we've talked about it many times and studied it. Verse 11 of 1 Timothy 2. Or 2 Timothy 2, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 2, 11. It is a faithful saying. 2 Timothy 2, 11. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's who we are. We, we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. If we are dead with him, we live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. That's a verse about reigning. If we deny him... We will not reign. Those rewards of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which are positions of rank and authority in the heavenlies, he will deny us those. If we believe not, yet he abideth, what? Faithful. He cannot deny himself. These, this verse says, even if you stop believing, if you say, you know what? It's all just a bunch of hooey. Because your salvation is not about your, your, your being preserved is not about you persevering. It's about what He does. We are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He preserves us based upon the fact that He has the power to do it. Not that we've done something. And in that very same passage of these things, put them in remembrance, verse 14, charging them about the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, to the subverting, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, in that very same passage where he says, you know, we, we, we have something, he will not deny us, even if we stop believing, but what's our responsibility? Study to show yourself approved but but we already aren't we accepted in the beloved so we are approved but study to show yourself approved so that you won't be cast away disapproved in at the judgment seat of Christ so the, understanding that distinction between and redemption is a real easy one to see are we redeemed spiritually absolutely has our body been redeemed absolutely not uh, spiritually, we are sanctified, we are justified. In the body, we seek to sanctify our body. We seek to possess our vessel with honor. And that's what we're supposed to do, so that, that what we live matches who we are. But that's not... that Saying that that is persevering, and that that in some way merits our staying saved. No. No. It's the result of what we have and the result of what we have in Christ and the security we have in Him. So, perseverance of the saints, it puts, it puts the, the preserving of us on what we do rather than the fact that God preserves us to the end. God preserves us into His kingdom. All right, let's bow in prayer, and if you have questions, we'll get to those. Our God and Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are secure in Him. We don't need to persevere in anything. We simply need to rest in who we are in Christ. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. Any questions about perseverance of the saints? Uh, to me, it's, you know, the more